I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 14. And in this module, we are going to very simply look at features of common and preferred stock. Now, companies may issue different types of stock. For example, a family business may create a Class A and a Class B stock. They may retain the Class A stock, which has voting rights, and sell to the public the Class B stock, which does not have voting rights. They're able to share the ownership of the business, but retain control of the business. Different classes of stock have advantages and disadvantages that can be modified on a company-by-company -company basis. Oftentimes, tax and financing considerations drive this process. Now, in addition to multiple classes of common stock, a company may issue preferred stock. It's called preferred because it has a preference in dividends. Its dividends are paid before the common shareholders get their distributions. Dividends are more or less expected each period. Preferred stock usually has a par value that's significant, and the dividend rate is stated as a percentage of par. For example, it may be 10% preferred stock, so 10% of par value would be the dividend. Some preferred stocks are cumulative. This means that if a company fails to pay a dividend in a particular period, that that dividend has to be paid at some point in the future before the common can ever collect those dividends. Dividends that have been missed on cumulative preferred stock are called dividends in arrears. Uh, they have to be brought current before other distributions can be made to other classes of shareholders. A uh, non-cumulative, if a dividend is missed, it's just lost to history. Preferred stock usually does not vote, not always, but typically it's not voting. It does maintain its liquidation preference. It's usually paid off after creditors, but before common stock. Preferred stock may be callable. That is, the company may reserve the right to repurchase it at a prearranged price within some particular time window. For example, callable at 105 means the company could buy back its preferred stock at 105% of its par value. Preferred stock may also be convertible. This is a nice feature because it enables the holder of those shares to exchange them for common shares. For example, there may be a three to one exchange ratio. Three shares of common might be issued for one share of preferred. This is great from an investor point of view because they get their preferred dividend and if the common stock appreciates significantly in value, they may be able to enjoy that ride by exchanging those preferred shares for the common. Some, some preferred stock may have a fixed maturity date that allows the company to buy back the stock or may even require the company to buy back the preferred stock at some future date. Now, looking at common stock more closely, typical features, some common sometimes pays dividends, sometimes it doesn't. Some common sometimes has preemptive rights, sometimes it doesn't. The preemptive right, something that would typically be specified in the Articles of Incorporation, says that if you own 10% of a company and the company wants to issue additional shares, you have a right of first refusal. You're able to buy or maintain your 10% ownership by buying in the new share issuance before those shares are offered to other parties. It's intended to prevent a particular shareholder's interest from being diluted. Oftentimes that feature is not present, however. A voting, normally the common stock has a voting right. It, it uh, enables that group of shareholders to control the company, elect the board of directors, select the auditor, basic matters of corporate governance. In the event of liquidation of a business, common shareholders come last in line. That's a bad thing, but the good thing is that it's their surpluses. They get all of the residual that doesn't go to creditors and preferred stock. All of the residual interest flows to the common stock. Common shareholders are entitled to receive reports on financial performance about a business that they own. Par value, a par value represents the legal capital of the firm. There is some historic precedent for this, although it is long since lost in history. Original purchases of stock are contingently liable to the company if they buy stock below par value. That is, the company can later call for additional capital contributions. As a result, most companies, when they issue stock, will issue it at a price far above par value. That negates any concern about a, an additional call on shareholders for additional capital contributions. It's usually stated as a nominal price. You might see a $1 or even a $0.01 cent par value. As a practical matter, then, par value is not just real important. But it does trigger accounting significance. Uh, we record common stock at its par value, and any purchase price or issue price in excess of par value is recorded to a paid-in capital in excess of par value account, as shown in this journal entry. Here the company issued 100,000 shares of $1 par value stock for $1 million. So they issued it at $10 a share. There's the debit to cash, $1 million. The credit to common stock is the $100,000. That's 100 thousand shares at one dollar par per share and the nine hundred thousand difference goes to paid in capital in excess of par. 
Some companies may issue stock without par value, in which case cash is debited and common stock is credited for the issue price. There would be no need to maintain a separate paid in capital account. A stock can be issued for other than cash, for land or other assets. The specific asset account would be debited instead of cash, and common stock would be credited for the fair value of the asset or the fair value of the stock, whichever is more clearly determinable. Cash dividends. Dividends are a matter of board discretion, at least and certainly insofar as common stock is concerned. Uh, many companies, however, pride themselves in a long history of regular dividends and even in increasing dividends on a regular basis. Other companies prefer to reinvest accumulated earnings in new ventures of the business. A dividend declaration is a formal action by the board of directors to indicate that a dividend will be paid. It establishes a legal liability of the company. A dividends account is a direct reduction of retained earnings. So let's see what happens. On the date of declaration, we debit dividends and credit dividends payable. When the payment occurs, we'll turn around and debit dividends payable and credit cash. Notice in this case, I've got a two month lag between the date of declaration and the date of payment. So let's think about those dates for a minute. The date of declaration is the day the board acts to declare a dividend. The date of payment is the day they disperse the funds. There's usually about a month after the date of declaration up until an ex-dividend date. The ex-dividend date determines when the right to receive the dividend shifts. So if you own stock on the date of declaration but sell it before the ex-dividend date, you lose the right to receive that dividend. If you own the stock on the date of declaration and continue to hold it beyond the ex-dividend date, then when you sell the stock, you will have retained the right to receive the dividend. So an ex-dividend date uh, usually precedes a date of record. Date of record is the formal date when a company would look at its shareholder records to determine who to distribute dividends to on the date of payment. The ex-dividend date for a practical matter for record keeping purposes exceeds the stipulated date of record by two or three days typically. Finally, let's look at the stockholders equity section. It should include detailed descriptions of the type of stock and its basic features. The number of shares authorized, the number issued, the number outstanding. Legal capital is a term used to mean total par value. Total paid in capital is the legal capital plus paid in capital in excess of par value. And here's an illustration of a stockholder's equity section that's fairly complex. I've got preferred stock and common stock with very detailed disclosures, additional paid in capital on both classes of stock, and then additional retained earnings to come up with the total stockholder's equity. To close this module, let's consider the presence of preferred stock just a bit more. In the illustration, we showed that there was $100 par value, 8% preferred stock. This means that it pays $8 in dividends per year for each share. And furthermore, it was cumulative. Any dividends that are missed will become dividends in arrears. Now, if the notes to the financial statements indicate that the company has not paid dividends for the last two years and $5 million of dividends are paid in total, the question is how much is paid to the preferred and how much is paid to the common. The mathematics here, $4.8 million will go to the preferred that it's $8 a share times 200,000 shares is a million six per year. They would need to pay the two years in arrears plus the current year, or three years at a million six each. So four million eight would go to the preferred shareholders. Only 200,000 of that dividend declaration would be available to the common shareholders. This indicates and emphasizes and underscores the importance of paying very close attention to the disclosures of the classes of stock and reviewing the footnotes to determine for example, whether the preferred stock is cumulative or not and whether there are dividends in arrears or not. Again, the dividends do not appear as a liability until they're actually declared by the board of directors.